Hi, my name is Sharon Chen and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. This video is an overview of fungi and is part of our Introduction to Microbiology series. The learning objectives are to recognize that fungi are common inhabitants of the environment and that a small subset cause disease in humans, to describe the basic structural features of yeast, molds, and dimorphic fungi, to distinguish between environmental fungi and those that colonize mucosal surfaces, to describe the pathogenesis of fungal invasion, and to explain how the host immune status affects susceptibility to fungal infection. So what are fungi? They are multicellular eukaryotes that evolved after protozoa, as you can see in the image. They are distinct from plants and animals. They are not able to make their own energy. They don't have photosynthesis. They depend on digesting and absorbing external nutrients. Thus, they live off of dead or decaying organic matter. In other words, they are saprophytes. In order to obtain nutrition, they secrete a number of hydrolytic enzymes to destroy organic matter. Now, try to imagine how fungi decompose organic matter in nature. Later, I'll ask you to imagine the same process happening in our body. There are thousands of fungi that have been described and many more that are yet to be discovered. Many of these species are important in the recycling of organic matter in forests. Some of these fungi you will recognize because they are important for making beer or certain types of cheeses. A very small subset of these fungi, about 500, are medically important and cause disease in humans. Most of these 500 fungi cause disease in humans with an abnormal immune system. Only about 100 actually cause disease in immunocompetent hosts. In the box is a list of the medically important fungi that we will discuss in our course. We have grouped them for you to provide an organizational structure. Fungi can cause many medical problems in humans. In this course, we will be focusing on fungi that cause infection. They are called mycoses. The CT scan of the lung that you can see on this slide shows you a fungal infection of the lung, a pneumonia due to aspergillus. Fungi can cause other medical problems besides infections. Their spores are responsible for some allergic diseases, and a few fungi produce chemicals that can be toxic to humans if ingested. These are called mycotoxins. Mushroom poisoning is one example. The picture you see on the slide is a poisonous mushroom that has psychoactive agents. It can induce hallucinations if you ingest it. As I mentioned before, fungi are eukaryotes, so they have organelles, mitochondria, and a nucleus, just like our cells. It's all surrounded by a lipid bilayer, just like our cells. But fungi have their own unique features. Their membrane doesn't contain cholesterol, but a similar lipid called ergosterol. You can see it in the drawing, the brown stuff that's pointed by the arrow. Surrounding the membrane is a cell wall that provides rigidity and shape. It's different from bacteria and plants, and it's made up of different types of polysaccharides. So let's talk about these different polysaccharides. I will proceed from the inside out. Chitin is a long-chain polymer of a derivative of glucose. The next layer is made of beta-glucans, which are branch glucose polymers. Galactomannans are next. These are polymeric sugars containing mannose with galactose side chains. Both beta-glucans and galactomannans are currently used in diagnostic tests for fungal infections because pieces of these can be found in our blood if we are infected with fungi. We don't normally have these molecules. Some of these polysaccharides are PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and they are recognized by the innate immune system. The cell wall also contains embedded proteins that can be modified with sugars, that is, they are glycosylated. You can see these in the drawings as the outer layer of the cell wall. Glycosylated proteins are important in how fungi attach to cells, and they're important for recognition by the host immune system. Similar to bacteria, the cell wall determines cell shape. Cell shape can be used to categorize medically important fungi. The simplest shape is an independent single cell. These are called yeasts. They can be spherical or elongated. When elongated, they are called pseudohyphae. Candida is a typical yeast and can also grow as pseudohyphae. You can see a picture of the pseudohyphae on the slide, and it shows you a constriction between the spherical-like shape and the elongated shape. Another fungal shape is hyphae. These are long, branching filamentous structures. Some are internally divided by perforated septae, so it's not just the constriction as seen in pseudohyphae. In the picture, the septum are represented by the brown donut-shaped structure. Molds grow as these long, branching structures. To distinguish between molds, we use their reproductive structures, sometimes called fruiting bodies. In nature and in culture plates, reproductive structures appear. Now, of note, this doesn't happen when molds are inside our body. Clinical microbiologists can use them to identify the specific type of mold. Aspergillus is a typical 
typical example of a mold and can cause severe disease in people who are immune compromised. Here are drawings of the reproductive structures for four different Aspergillus species. They look very different, but they're all Aspergillus. There are some fungi that can take the form of both yeast and molds. These are called thermally dimorphic fungi, dimorphic meaning two forms. In higher temperatures, like inside our body, these fungi take on the yeast form. In lower temperatures, such as in nature, or perhaps 25 degrees Celsius in the laboratory, they take on a mold form. Coccidioides is a typical example of a thermally dimorphic fungi. Coccidioides resides in the soil, commonly in the southwestern states of the United States and California. Geographic restriction is common for most of the thermally dimorphic fungi. The drawings show you the shape of coccidioides as a mold in its hyphal form in the environment and then as a yeast in our body. I just discussed how coccidioides lives in the soil and in our environment. There are other fungi that also live in our environment. Here's a picture of Aspergillus growing on bread, and the close-up of the fuzzy material shows you the reproductive structures that have the spores or conidia. In contrast to environmental fungi, there are fungi that colonize us, our mucosa and our skin, and they live on us without causing disease. They are part of our microbiota. A good example is Canada, which colonizes our mucosal surfaces. So here's a picture of Canada colonizing oral mucosa of the tongue. This is called thrush. And in the close-up, you can see that these plaques of Canada biofilm are tightly attaching to the mucosa of the tongue. You can't scrape this stuff off. Dermatophytes are another fungi that colonize us. They are a large group of fungi that you will see causing superficial skin, nail, and hair infections. They are very well adapted to living in keratin tissues. They live in the very superficial layers of our skin and don't invade into deeper tissue. Several factors allow pathogenic fungi to cause disease. As I just said, dermatophytes are restricted to the superficial layers of the skin. They grow best at the lower temperatures of the skin and not at the deeper tissue layers, which are at higher temperatures. This is an example of temperature restriction. In fact, most fungi cannot grow well at higher temperatures found within mammals. Another factor that allows fungi to cause disease is intracellular survival. Let me show you this animation to illustrate. You can see the phagocyte moving through the cells. This is called diapodesis. And the phagocyte's job is to ingest spores and destroy them. And in fact, most spores are killed this way. But some fungi can survive inside the phagocyte. How? Well, fungi can produce pigments like melanin, which protects them from being killed by reactive oxygen species produced by the phagocyte. The pigments can also modulate host immune response. In the environment, fungi naturally makes these pigments like melanin to protect itself from UV radiation, just like us. Lastly, some fungi survive by hiding inside a capsule to evade immune responses such as complement and antibody. Another factor that allows fungi to cause disease is the ability to invade. In immunocompromised hosts, there is more of a chance of fungi germinating and spreading. This is because phagocytes don't function properly or they are not appropriately trafficked to the problem area from cytokine signaling. Once fungi get into an alveolar epithelial cell, they can form hyphae and then secrete enzymes that digest tissue. They can then easily cross tissue barriers causing locally invasive destruction. Remember, when you imagine fungi decomposing organic material in the environment, now imagine it decomposing and digesting your tissue. Local invasion of hyphae can lead to dissemination. The hyphae can go through all tissues, including blood vessels. And as you can see, sections of hyphae can break off and then disseminate hematogenously. Pathogenesis is a function of the intrinsic properties of the fungus and of the host. As we said before, the immune competency of the host is key. A patient who has a deficient immune system, for whatever reason, is more at risk of invasive and disseminated fungal disease. Here's an example of a bone marrow transplant patient who has a mucor infection, a type of mold infection that started in the sinuses and then locally spread through the tissues to the orbit and other surrounding structures. These are life-threatening infections. In fact, this patient died two weeks after transplant. Mold infections are a concern for many immune deficient patients, including those with poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. The opposite is true for immunocompetent patients. Infections are not life-threatening. In the picture, you can see an abnormal-looking toenail from a dermatophyte infection. Occasionally, in immunocompetent people, we can see more invasive disease. For example, localized lung infection or brain infection, meningitis, from thermally dimorphic fungi.